So welcome back. So we're trying to work out what the distribution for this random variable s is going to be, where s is the quotient of the random variable y over the random variable x, where x and y are independent and they're both chi-square distributed, y with d1 degrees of freedom and x with d2 degrees of freedom. So the way we're going to do this is by trying now to find what the CDF for this random variable s is going to be. Remember, whenever you do these sort of transformations of random variables, it's always easier to work with the CDF and then differentiate to find the PDF afterwards. So let's consider, what is the probability then that big S is less than or equal to some value little s? And I'm going to assume that this value little s is a positive real number. We've already discussed the fact that for the negative real numbers and zero, the PDF and indeed the CDF of my random variable big S is going to be zero. So it's only interesting to consider little s is a positive real value. So that's what we'll be considering. And we need to now think of that in terms of our joint random variable of x and y here. So we know that x and y can take on values in this upper quadrant here, and that the probability of getting a specific point x, y, or the probability density of getting that, is given by this here. We also know that if we take this little s from here, we can find the locus of points that all have that same value little s, and it will look like a straight line here. I've said already that this is a positive real number, so it will be one of these straight lines. So now, let's think about all the s values that are smaller than that, but still greater than zero. If I took half that s, then it would be, its locus of points that have that value would be all the points on the line of gradient, a half the gradient of this one. If I took a third, it would be all of the points on the line with gradient a third of this one. So in fact, actually, all of these points below this line, they have all got s values that are smaller than the s value of the points on this line. And in fact, the ones above here will have s values greater than the s value of the points on this line. So actually, if I want to consider all of the points, all of the x, y points that have an s value less than or equal to little s, it's all of the points in this sort of infinite triangle here that I want. Therefore, the probability of getting that is going to be the integral of this probability density function over that region. So now I've found the region that I need to integrate this joint PDF over. And if you look at this, it makes far more sense to perform this integral in polar coordinates because I'm integrating from zero to infinity r-wise and then just from zero to this angle here of this line. So, so we're going to perform the integral not in the Cartesian coordinate system, but in the polar coordinate system. The integration will be far, far simpler. If we were to do it in the Cartesian coordinate system, we'd have to have our boundaries, our limits of integration. The limits of integration for the first inner integral would be dependent on the variable for the second outer integral, which is just much more painful. So the better way to do this is with polar coordinates. So we just need to find what this angle is going to be. And that's not too difficult at all. It's obviously going to depend on what your s value is. If you think about the triangle, we know that this line is going to be given by y is equal to sx. So its gradient is s. So if you go along in the x domain by 1, you'll go up s in the y domain. Therefore, this triangle is going to have um, adjacent 1 and uh, opposite s. And here's the angle here. So we can find that using trigonometry, it'll just be tan inverse of s over 1, tan inverse of s. So this angle phi here is going to be tan inverse of s. So I can now write down what this probability is going to be. It's going to be the integral of this great big PDF from 0 to this angle phi, which is tan inverse of s, from 0 to infinity for r, and then I just need to translate this PDF into polar coordinates. So this initially comes out as a bit of a monster. So remember, we're integrating this over this infinite triangle here. So in polar coordinates, the integral from 0 to that angle phi, which is tan inverse of s, 
the integral from zero to infinity, which is integrating from r values of zero all the way out to infinity of this PDF. So this bit is a constant, so it remains there. So it's a half to the power of d1 plus d2 over two divided by gamma of d1 over two gamma d2 over two. We'll pull this bit out in a moment in our next step because it's just a constant. Then we've got x to the power of d2 over 2 minus 1. That now needs to be replaced with its polar form. So r cos theta to the power of d2 over 2 minus 1. Then y to the power of d1 over 2 minus 1. That needs to be replaced again with its polar form, which is r sine theta. So r sine theta to the power of d1 over 2 minus 1. And then this bit here, e to the power of minus a half um, x plus y, we need to replace x and y with their polar form. So this is r cos theta, this is r sine theta. We'll factor the r out, so we'll get minus r over 2 times cos theta plus sine theta. And then, of course, we're integrating in polar coordinates, and we need that r there. So it's not just dr d theta. When you integrate with polar coordinates, it has to be r dr d theta. So uh, we've got that there. So let's work on this integral then. So the first thing I'm going to do is pull some constants out. So we'll start with these gammas here. Now, because I know the way this story goes, I'm not going to pull this a half to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2 out, because that's actually going to end up cancelling. So I'm going to leave that where it is inside the inner integral. However, these gammas, they are going to survive right until the very end. In fact, they do appear up in this final formula for the PDF of the F distribution, just in a disguised form. So this thing here, this is the beta function, beta of d1 over 2 and d2 over 2. And one of the ways to define the beta function, and there are other ways, more complicated ways, but one of the ways to define it is in terms of the gamma distribution. And I've written down its definition in terms of the gamma distribution here. So beta of two numbers, a and b, that are greater than zero is equal to gamma of a times gamma of b divided by gamma of a plus b. So that is a definition for the beta distribution, one of the definitions for the beta distribution, the only definition that we need to know for the purposes of this video in terms of the gamma function. So actually, if you write out what this is in gamma functions, this would be gamma of d1 over 2 times gamma of d2 over 2, and then in the numerator you'd have gamma of d1 plus d2 over 2. So actually, in this final formula, you've got in your denominator gamma of d1 over 2 times gamma of d2 over 2. And in fact, those are going to be the same gammas that are here already in the denominator. So we'll pull those out because they are going to survive the entire horrific integral that we have here. So they're there, 1 over gamma of d1 over 2 times gamma of d2 over 2. And now we've got the integral from 0 to tan inverse of s. And now I've pulled some things out of the inner integral into the outer integral because they are, are just constants with respect to the inner integration. So the inner integration is integration of r. So we can pull out things that don't involve r. So here, I've split this into r to the power of this times cos to the power of this, and I've split this also into r to the power of this times sine to the power of this, and then I've pulled these cos and sines out of the inner integral because they are just constants with respect to the inner integral. So we've got cos theta to the power of d2 over 2 minus 1, and sine theta to the power of d1 over 2 minus 1. So hopefully you're comfortable with me doing that. Now let's go to the inner integral. So we've got the integral over r from 0 to infinity. We've still got the half to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2, which I'm keeping there because I know it's going to cancel. I know the way this story goes. And then we've got r to the power of d2 over 2 minus 1 times r to the power of d1 over 2 minus 1. So combining that together, that gives us r to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2 minus 2. So why have I written r to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2 minus 1. Why isn't there a minus 2 here? Well, it's because we had an r here as well. So combining that in, we get just the, just the minus 1 rather than the minus 2. And then uh, I haven't changed this bit. This is still just e to the power of minus r over 2 cos of theta plus sine of theta dr. So we want to now try and perform this inner integration. And you might think, oh, this looks very, very complicated because we've still got these cos theta plus sine theta. But actually, they're not that complicated because they are just constants with respect to this integration. So actually, we've just got e to the power of minus a half, a constant, a positive constant, actually, over our 
the integration domain for theta. So we're only interested in going from zero to tan inverse of s, and tan inverse of s is something less than 90 degrees, less than pi by 2 radians. So actually, if you think about what cos and sine are doing over that first part of their domain, from 0 to pi by 2, they're both positive, and when one is 0, the other is not 0. So this is always actually going to be a non-zero, non-negative uh, real number. So it's going to be a positive real number, this thing here. So that's not too horrific, actually, at all. All we need to do is do a change of variables. Ignore the outer integral for a moment. Just focus on this integral here. We can do this. This is just a constant. In fact, it's going to come out as one of these gamma function integrals. All we need to do is get it into the right form. So we need to replace this r over 2 times cos theta plus sine theta just with a new variable, which we'll call u. So we're going to concentrate then on performing this integral here, and we're going to do it by integration by substitution. And the substitution we're going to make is u is equal to r over 2 times cos theta plus sine theta. Now, as I just explained to you, this value, cos theta plus sine theta, this is a constant with respect to this integral, and it's a positive constant because the theta values that we are interested in range from 0 to pi by 2. I've sketched here what the functions cos and sine look like on that sort of um, domain. So here is 0, here is pi by 2, this is cos theta, this is sine theta, so they are always non-negative. The smallest they are is 0, Z sine is 0 at 0, cos is 0 at pi by 2. But you'll notice that when they are equal to zero, the other one is not zero. So when you add them together, the thing that you're going to get is always going to be a positive real number. So this value is always a positive real number. It's not negative and it's not zero. This is a beautiful substitution to use the integration by substitution because it's a nice linear bijective map. And if you think about what the domain of R that we're integrating over is. It's from zero to infinity. Think of what this map is. If this is R here, and this is U on the y-axis here, it's a lovely linear map from here to here. When R is zero, U is being mapped onto zero, and as R gets indefinitely big, U is also going to get indefinitely big. Indeed, it's a bijective map from zero infinity to zero infinity. It's linear even. It's a beautiful substitution to use, really simple substitution. So it's going to be a perfectly simple integration. We don't need to worry about anything not working here. So it's going to be the integral from zero to infinity. The limits are going to still be zero and infinity, as I've just explained to you the way this map works. When r is zero, u will be zero. And as r goes off to infinity, u is also going to go off to infinity. And now we just need to make the substitution. So I've started this here. The half to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2, that remains the same. And now I've taken r and I've substituted in what it is in terms of u. So I've just rearranged this to get that uh, this is a bijective map, so it's perfectly um, reversible. So we can put the 2 up here and take the cos theta plus sine theta onto the bottom and we'll get that r is equal to 2u over cos theta plus sine theta. So I've put that in for r here. And then we've got that to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2 minus 1. The substitution's easy here because it was designed to be that part. So we've got e to the negative u. And then we just need to replace dr with what it is in terms of du. Differentiating this here, we get du by dr is equal to, well, this is just a constant times r, so we just end up with that constant, so it's just a half times cos theta plus sine theta. So now, rearranging that, we get that dr is equal to 2 du over cos theta plus sine theta, so that's what I've put in here, 2 times du divided by cos theta plus sine theta. Let's simplify this now. So the first thing is that this is going to cancel with this 2 to the power of this and this 2 here. So pull the 2 out of here and you get 2 to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2 minus 1. Multiply that by 2 and that minus 1 goes. So you've just got 2 to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2. But here you've got a half to the power of d1 plus d2 
over 2. So you can combine them together to get 2 times a half to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2. But of course, 2 times a half is 1. 1 to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2 is just 1. So that goes, and that 2 goes there, and that 2 goes there. Then let's pull apart this u to this power and this cos plus sine theta to this power as well. So we then get u to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2 minus 1 in the numerator. And then we'll combine this cos or this 1 over cos theta plus sine theta to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2 minus 1 with this 1 over cos theta plus sine theta. So this one cancels off that minus 1 again. So you've just got 1 over cos theta plus sine theta to the power of d1 plus d2 over 2. The e to the negative u then remains, and then we've got du. So what we're next going to do, of course, is pull this bit out of this integral, because this is a constant with respect to this integral, and then you'll notice that this thing that we're left with is then one of the gamma function integrals, so we'll just replace it with uh, what it is in terms of the gamma function.